It's old timey crimey. I'm Christy. And I am Amber. And I am still recovering from surgery, but I'm feeling well enough to tell Amber an absolutely uh, bonkers and infuriating tale from American history. And I have no idea what kind of story she's going to tell me. Yeah, yeah. It's a little, we're doing something a little slightly different here. Instead of our usual, you know, murder tales from yore, I'm going to be talking about a period in American history during which, ooh, well, hmm. We're not nice to women. (laughs) I'm just going to say it. Never really have been. But it's a specific example of a time period and uh, something that we were doing. So that's that's fun. But don't forget, there is the Patreon where you can find even more content. Patreon.com slash oldtimeycrimey. And you can get for $5 a month, five bonus episodes every month. Now, this takes place, the the story I'm going to tell, in 19... 18 and 19. And so if you were living back then and you had $5 burning a hole in your pocket, you and uh, 49 of your closest pals could go to the uh, afternoon matinee of Mary Miles Minter in Mate of the Sally Ann. Or you could fast forward to 2022 and spend that $5 to get not only the five episodes a month, but also all the back catalog. Well over 100 episodes. I feel like your your dollar definitely stretched further uh, way back then. But that's okay. You still get a lot for five bucks. And you know what? If you brought 49 of your closest friends into your home and listened to all of the stuff on the Patreon together, we wouldn't know. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Now you're thinking. Yeah, so it's pretty much uh, the same thing. <laughs> because the the possibility is there. So, uh, let's get patriotic, shall we? Oh, no. Let's talk about the American plan. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, let's start with uh, the Sacramento Bee in an article on February 26, 1919. Quote, Using suspicion as their only guide in an effort to clean up the city as ordered by federal authorities, the Moral Squad appointed by... Oh, (laughs) no. Oh, yeah appointed by the chief of police, ran at the instigation of the Commissioner of Public Health and Safety, brought 22 women into the health office yesterday, indiscriminately picked up in lodging houses and hotels in the city. Were they showing ankle? Um, they were ladies, and therefore they might be diseased. Oh, yes. So, uh, out of the 22 women picked up in this roundup, they kept 16 at the hospital all day for examination, The others were held overnight. Out of these 22 women and the examinations they forced upon them, only one was found to have a sexually transmitted infection. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That's that's not really a good rate. That's not a great stat to show success. (laughs) So No. Because isn't, like, the, the rate now, like, one in eight people or something? Oh, I have no idea, actually. I didn't think to look that up, even though I have rates from back then. It's either one in eight or one in four have or have had some sort of uh, sexually transmitted infection or disease. Possibly. So I, I feel like back then, these women were way better than we are now. <laughs> right? <laughs> so uh, this from the Sacramento Bee Describing the situation, in other words, out of 22 suspects subjected to an examination, the police were justified in arresting but one woman. Now, I'll agree to disagree about the meaning of the word justified, the Sacramento Bee, because I don't believe that we should be picking people up off the streets just indiscriminately, whether or not they have an infection. Maybe that's what the aliens have been doing all along with those anal probes. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Tie one mystery to one, well, it's not really a mystery. Just checking. (laughs) It's going to stick a finger up here. Now, I actually, this was when I realized in my research that I need a name for that fake old-timey newspaper man in my head that I argue with mentally when I'm doing research (laughs) and I see shit like this. Chip Chipmeyer. Isn't that actually... I have no idea. I think we have a Chip Minimeyer, something like that, as a local uh, columnist or something. What about a Clyde? Or a Chet... Chet. Chet sounds good. There we go. Chet. Chet Baker. I'm going to call him Chet Baker. Chet Baker, local news. But maybe when he's in the South, 
It's a different guy. Maybe it's like Beauregard. Or Chet Chester. Chet Chester. Oh, boy. All right, Chet Chester. Yeah. All right, so he yeah. He later went on to sell chicken. Chet Chester and I have uh, different, different meanings of the word justified. So not only did they uh, keep them overnight, some of the women, they did not keep them in the hospital. They took them to jail and refused them any communication with the outside. Now, one of these women was not only free of any sort of infection, she was also married. It's really just to me this, the cutest thing. So adorable how the newspaper treats that like pure evidence that this is unjustified. I mean, I know it's unjustified because it's a stupid thing to do and terrible, but they seem to be like, oh, well, as soon as she's got a ring on her finger, she's immune. <laughs> she can't possibly get anything sexually transmitted. Immune. And that's not even saying, like, she can't step outside the marriage. If her husband steps outside the marriage and then hops back to her, guess who's getting a sexually transmitted infection? But that's not the point of this, because if, if that was the point of this, they would pick up men, too. They're only picking up women. Exactly. Exactly. This is... This is in the name of public health, but that's name only. A ring doesn't protect you from gonorrhea unless it's the ring at the top of a condom, people. So it just shows how black and white the thinking was, at least in public spaces like the newspaper, where, you know, that, that ring on your finger meant you were safe. So let's talk about this married woman. Uh, her name was Margaret Hennessy. She was the wife of H.J. Hennessy, a foreman at Standard Oil Company in Richmond, which is not far from Sacramento, about 70 miles. Margaret was visiting her sister, who is only identified as Mrs. M. Bradditch. Uh, she was recovering from influenza, Margaret was. And so she came to stay with her sister, have somebody to take care of her. Margaret also had a six-year-old son, and she had brought him with her as well. He was attending school at a local convent. So Margaret and her sister were doing a little bit of shopping. They'd gone out and ironically gone to the meat market, which is mm, kind yeah. of funny. <laughs> uh, but the officers, who were part of a moral squad patrol that had formed just that morning, arrested them and took them to the hospital around 11 a.m. Margaret tried to tell them, hey, look, I'm, I'm just in from out of town. I'm visiting my sister. I've been sick with influenza, I swear. It's just influenza. <laughs> <laughs> it's not any of the sexually things that you think I could get, but they wouldn't listen. Uh, they said she was being arrested as a suspicious character and yet refused to even look at her identification. When she told them her son was at school, you know, she's like, I got to take care of this. He's going to be out in a couple hours. She said, quote, they paid no heed, but took my sister and I to the hospital. They kept her until about 8 p.m., so about nine hours and then let her out after her test came back, a negative. They uh, told her to come to court the next morning for some reason. And she was like, yeah, you betcha I'm coming to court. I got some things to say. The newspaper uh, put this as, quote, she did so to take this opportunity of protesting against the attack on her reputation. <sighs> of course, it's an attack on her reputation. We wouldn't want anybody thinking she's a dirty, dirty whore. Well, that's just what they're saying, but, like, she knew that this was wrong, this was handled wrong, this should not happen, and it should not happen to anybody else. Exactly, so exactly. So she's like, I will absolutely be there, and you will hear what I have to say. Yeah, and it's it's not, the, the paper puts it as her reputation, but it's also the experience that she went through of being forced to undergo a very private examination. Yeah. So uh, this is what she said. I think it is a terrible shame to be submitted to such an indignity as I went through yesterday. At the hospital, I was forced to submit an examination to an examination just as if I was one of the most degraded women in the world. Oh, Margaret. I want to say I have never been so humiliated in my life. I welcomed the chance to go into court this morning and defend myself, but found I would have no chance. They declined to charge her, so there's no venue for her to talk. She said, I am in, in this position now. I dare not venture on the streets for fear I will be arrested again. It's true, though. It, if they thought that she, she was a shady character before. Yeah, it's 100% true. Yeah, it's, it's sad how true it is. So the police won't give any answers as to why she and her sister were, were sort of targeted in this raid. And so the only possible 
reason she can come up with is that her sister takes in lodgers and has four young men lodging in her home. But Margaret insists that, quote, my sister is conducting a proper place. And notice they didn't arrest the lodgers. Right? Gee, hmm. This, this is, I, I hate to say this, but sexually transmitted diseases and infections are not a one-way street. No, they are not. <laughs> they can pass both ways, believe it or not. So the commissioner of public health, uh, his last name is Simmons, he defends this whole situation. He says, in every raid, these complaints come in and, to my knowledge, they are groundless. Because in every case in which suspicious persons were held, there were circumstances surrounding the case which warranted the suspicion. All right. So I think we need to start arresting men and doing a uh, forced uh, pelvic floor exam. Um, See how they like it. Yeah, exactly. What's good for the goose, right? And uh, so, yeah, he's basically saying this happens all the time. We arrest people because we suspect them of something, but they turn out to be innocent. And obviously there's nothing wrong with that system. (laughs) And then the whiners just need to shut up and deal. Now, how is this legal? Well, there was a city ordinance in addition to other laws that we'll get into. And uh, the, the newspaper says the city ordinance gives the police power to detain anyone who is suspected of carrying a contagious disease. Now, this is one of the purposes of the Moral Squad, but I think it's really interesting if you think about the name. They call it a Moral Squad, not a Public Health Squad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is not hashtag squad goals. So their, their true purpose kind of reveals itself a little bit there. Just a little bit. Uh, but then you have, on the other hand, the police chief, Ira Conran, and he is just has no problem throwing the commissioner under the bus, and I love it. I'm here for it, okay? So this is what he says. I know that the method in which the squad is carrying out its arrests is practically ridiculous. Probably many innocent women have been and will be caught in it, simply because they re- reside in lodging houses or hotels, but I am simply carrying out orders from Simmons. I asked him to give me some foundation to work on, to give me a few specific cases or definite instructions where to send my men, but Simmons insists that the federal officers just want a general cleanup, and he doesn't know where any of the trouble is. So I send my men shooting at the moon, as it were. Now, I don't know how much of this is, you know, true or how much of this is him trying to save his ass, um, but, you know, aside from his, oh, I was just following orders, which, you know, give it... 20 years and that won't super fly. Um, <laughs> but aside from that, you know, he, he, he's basically saying, I tried to make this into something more legitimate, you know, that wouldn't catch innocent people in its net, but he had nothing for me. He was just like, I don't know. You do. I'm just here to tell you what to do. But you're the one managing the people that are going out there. So you are the police chief. You should know where the trouble might lie. I agree with that. Or you should at least be able to find somebody who does. If you as a police chief can't find out that where there is vice and immorality going on in your city so you can arrest some women on suspicion of having a, you know, an infection, then uh, maybe you should be police chief. That seems like information you should be able to find out. Or... Maybe you don't need to send that squad out after all, because if you can't find it, it's not there. There you go. So, then he basically says uh, he thinks the city is as clean as it's going to be, and that that there are, uh, you know, there's 75,000 people in the city. The police department doesn't have the ability to stop all clandestine meetings. I would argue they're not stopping clandestine meetings. No, they're arresting just random women out shopping. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Oh, you happen to be out on the street? (laughs) Well, we know what we think about women who are out on the street. If you are walking, Jesus Christ, it is exactly like Margaret said. You can't leave your house. You could be arrested for leaving the house with a vagina. Yeah. So, uh, he continues uh, throwing Simmons under the bus. He goes into detail about why this is stupid. He elaborates. He says they have two officers on this beat, seven days a week, eight hours a day. One of them said the sweep that got Margaret, um, he talked about that and said, well, I recognized at least half a dozen of the women that we arrested because they ran boarding houses. And when I tried to do a little, you know, like sting on them and see if they'd serve me liquor, they refused. So these are women who won't even serve liquor, but they must be dirty, dirty hoes. 
Maybe he was just mad that they wouldn't give him a shot. He's like, all right, fuck it. Let's arrest all of them. No, but he said, like, he's like, this is one of the moral squad dudes. Yeah. And he's like, I don't think he's mad. I think he's like, this is ridiculous. They won't even give me alcohol. They're not going to give anybody sex. (laughs) They're not going to be going around. And even if they were, why is it anybody's business? But why don't you have that, that... In your brain, where it's like, I know that these women are not doing bad things. I guess I'll arrest them anyway. Like, where he's they... he's just following orders too. But that's the thing; nobody's really giving specific orders. So who are you to follow non-specific anything? Make your own fucking rules. Everyone else is. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so uh, Conran basically says that, you know, they he had no choice. The cleanup squad, as he called it, Jesus Christ had to do just indiscriminate arrests to show that they were trying to do what public health had asked them to do. So somebody in federal level tells the public health guy, hey, you got to run some, you know, I want to see you have something to show for any money we're giving you for this program. And the guy at public health says, okay, police chief, it's time to round up some dirty women. And the police chief is like, I guess I got to prove that I can round up some women, dirty or not. (laughs) And then goes out and literally just rounds up some women. And uh, he also does, I I do like that he throws Simmons under the bus. I don't like how he's like, none of this is my fault. Uh, He goes on to say it's not his fault that innocent women are being swept up in this and then denied any communication or privileges like actual criminals would get. Uh, He says, no, they go straight to the health department. And from there, it's out of my hands. Uh, And then I do not like what he says about this. When a person is turned over to the health department, Dr. Hanna is supreme, and they are subject to whatever he wants to do. Mm, I don't like it. Mm -mm. Don't like that. Don't like that. (laughs) That's uh, that's uncomfortable. That's very uncomfy. I don't like it. So, really, the article, this is all from the same article in the Sacramento Bee about this instance, and it finishes up with, I I feel, the choicest bit. The, The lead here is buried six feet deep. So three women at the isolation hospital, which they also called the prophylactic hospital, had escaped the previous night during a storm. I love these ladies. So Jean Pollock, Helen Wilson, and Billy Fuller gathered up all the sheets they could find and made themselves a little escape rope. Classic. I enjoy that. And uh, they climbed down from the second floor. And as of the publication of that article, we're still on the loose. Loose women on the loose, but not really loose women, just women, and the powers that be have decided that they're loose because they exist. One article a uh, little does have the first of these ladies being held on a charge of p- p- petty larceny. Uh, said she'd been arrested about six weeks prior for stealing women's clothing from hotel rooms. Stealing from hotel rooms was really a big thing <laughs> for like decades. And uh, Helen Wilson had been picked up for soliciting three and a half months prior at uh, the Tavern Cafe during a raid. From my research, she was the only one who was picked back up about two months later and sentenced to the county jail for six months for breaking quarantine. So here were some times and places and situations in which women could be arrested. If they were in a restaurant alone, if they got a new job, or as we see, uh, walking down the street. Going to the meat market. Really? It's just existing? Existing. Exactly. Yeah. And the thing is, is that there's also, you know, it, it, it can get even darker because human beings can get dark sometimes. Some people did use it for intimidation and revenge. We know that at the very least, the authorities in charge, both at the health department and the police department, would arrest women on what they call reasonable suspicion if said women had turned them down for sex. It's funny that you think if she turns you down, she must have a disease. If she turned me down, arrest her. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like that um, when a, a, a guy hits on a woman and you know, she says no, and then all of a sudden she becomes a dirty slut. You're a bitch. It's like, but wait a second. How am I a dirty slut if I won't sleep with you? Yes. Wouldn't the opposite be true? I'm only a dirty slut once I say yes. Anyhow, makes no sense, but. Hey there, beloved listeners. If you're enjoying this episode, then you absolutely should check out our Patreon. 
That's patreon.com slash oldtimeycrimey, which is the absolute best way you can support the show and get something in return. For just $5 a month, you get five bonus episodes a month. On the Patreon, we frequently talk about old-timey crimes you won't hear about anywhere else. Crimes that have been forgotten by time and erased by history that you won't read about on Wikipedia, Murderpedia, or really any pedia. We also delve into the old newspapers for the wacky wild crimes like the thieving lion tamer and the spaceman intruder. Or talk about strange, delightful customs like nutting day while learning about the time people rioted over cheese. <laughs> so come t- we can't even talk about it in our own promo without giggling. I love nutting day. <laughs> nutting day is the best day. So come check out the Patreon for more of the weirdest, wildest, and most shocking old-timey crime. That's patreon.com slash oldtimey crimey. Where's the link? <laughs> In the show notes. <laughs> I knew I was not going to get through Nutting Day without giggling. (laughs) And, of course, we had racism and ethnophobia playing their part. It seemed like, by some coincidence, more women of color and immigrants were picked up for morals charges than white women. Shocking. Shockingly enough. Also, once they were in custody, they got worse treatment. Also shocking. I know, right? It's just full of surprises here. This program had been going on throughout the decade and would continue uh, into the 19... Want to guess what decade? No, you said 19, so my guess is already out the window. Oh. (laughs) Well, into the 1950s. If you were lucky. In other places, it went on uh, as late as the 1970s. Or the 2020s. (laughs) Well, yeah, um... We'll get into a little bit of uh, more recent history, uh, somewhat related to this whole program. And just a reminder, this this whole thing sucks. But American history, Jesus Christ, you had 64,000 people forcibly sterilized under eugenic legislation between 1907 and 1963. So... I love how American history just loves to... just sweep things under the rug be like nope not gonna teach that not gonna talk about it never happened but first we get all up in people's genitals yeah <laughs> and then we sweep it under the rug <laughs> well i mean that's what they do at clubs now but in a different context yeah. <laughs> genitals genitals, genitals. <laughs> <laughs> so uh the question of how many women did this affect on History.com, Scott W. Stern tells us, uh, he d- does seem to be like the person who kind of brought this back into light in the public. Tens of thousands, per- tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of American women were detained and forcibly examined for STIs. The program was modeled after similar ones in Europe, under which the authorities stalked suspicious women, arresting, testing, and imprisoning them. So when the tests were positive... Uh, Stern tells us treatment involved being tossed in jail or in another prophylactic hospital, which may as well be jail. Literally, do not pass go, do not collect $200, don't even have your moment in court. Then comes the treatment. Maybe they'll uh, shoot you up with some mercury, a diseased whore, or force you to take some arsenic. And if you dare get mouthy about the fact that they're giving you all of these horrifying treatments... Um, well, we'll give you some corrective punishment. We might toss you in solitary, beat you, or going back to the eugenics thing, sterilize you against your wishes. This is nice. This is, this is lovely. lovely. Mm -hmm. So, why were we doing this, aside from the very cynical reasons that we know? Uh, Because we were at war. And war means soldiers. And soldiers were getting gonorrhea and syphilis like it was going out of style. So one widely published article about the deadly byproduct of sexual immorality said that in 1916, there were 3.6 cases of syphilis per 1,000 people in New York City. It's about the same rate that tuberculosis was at the time in the same setting. But I really feel like, all right, so you have 3.6 per 1,000. 
I really think like misinformation played a big part in disinformation in this whole program because some estimates uh, insisted that one in three soldiers had a sexually transmitted infection. So granted, that is measurement of two completely different populations. One is like the population of a city. One is just soldiers. But still, I, that one in three had to be inflated. But I'm also confused as to so. if you have all these soldiers with syphilis, I feel like you already know who the immoral members are. Yeah, yeah. They're all right there in line at a clinic. They're the ones that you are treating because they went out and found women to have sex with and caught a disease. And honestly, it was probably a lot of the same women, and uh, they paid good money for that. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll, we'll get into uh, where it was coming from because it's actually a little surprising here. Um, was it the convent? <laughs> we just did an old tiny crimey for the Patreon about deviant nuns. So um, I do love, just as a side note, that there's this panic about sexual infections. And on the very same page of this newspaper, which was the Arkansas Democrat, and likely many of the other papers that published the same article, there are ads for uh, things like Foley's Honey and Tar, William's Kidney and Liver Pills, and also Bond's Liver Pills. We are all about the liver. Now, like I said, there's kind of a little surprise in where these diseases are coming from. At first, the authorities were focusing on sex work in close proximity to military bases. Makes sense. One of the laws they passed um, was that uh, any woman basically existing within five miles of a military camp could be arrested on sus reasonable suspicion. Five miles. Five miles. That uh, doesn't make sense, but okay. So we really can't say it's the camp followers or whatever you want to call them. Um... Because they're all getting arrested, and the, uh, this is still happening. We're still having soldiers with uh, diseases. I feel really bad for the lady that lives, like, a mile away from base, and that's just been her house forever. Yeah. And any time she steps out to get the newspaper, somebody arrests her. <laughs> this again? Are you kidding me? This is the fifth one this week. <laughs> I just want to read the comics. So, and like I said about those numbers being inflated... Uh, we find out in 1918 that as far as overseas activity is concerned, they're not getting it from overseas either. Only 0.1% uh, of American soldiers were in hospital with ailments due to vice at that time. I mean, were these guys in the Navy? They were just giving them to each other. It's just all military. Like, you know, all the, all the militaries. I'm just going to pretend it's <laughs> the Navy. Probably and... quite a bit of Navy because it was the World, World War I. They all gave it to each other. <laughs> they all gave it to each other, yeah. I think they're really ignoring that as a possibility uh, as much as they can. They are, like, plugging their ears and humming, trying to not think Pretty of that much. as a possibility. They're like, no, it was the women. Yeah, it, couldn't, it could not have been our heroes. So they decided, since it's not the overseas whores and it's not the ones around the, the camp, I use that word very much in the, you know, making fun of them. Um, not the sex workers, but the... Uh, <laughs> the people back then um yeah it seemed like the conclusion they came to was uh you got to watch out for that girl next door a lot of these guys were showing up uh for duty and were already infected there you go there you go yeah or boot camp i'm still i, I still am like could be boot camp they too. could have been sticking it to each other we can't rule on any, anything out so it really is hard to get anything resembling reliable numbers uh, in that same article, the very same article, where they say that 0.1% of American soldiers in France are hospitalized for sexually transmitted infections. We find that the state health officer of Texas estimated that within the state, one million people had venereal diseases in 1918. Wowza. That is more than 20% of the population of the entire state. Impressive. So, uh, yeah, I, I like how in one point where they were talking about people uh, who were carrying, you know, syphilis, uh, they said a, a quarter of them were innocent victims. And we know that the innocent victims were just the soldiers, I guess, in their minds. Probably, yeah. Yeah. 
So, and I also have to mention that this article all about syphilis and gonorrhea in the armed forces uh, also mentions specifically Fort Dix, and I just didn't know what to do with that. Which still exists. Believe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, they also did things like, um, you know, trying to educate people on the, the dangers. <laughs> Here we have a lovely poster from the American Hygiene Society, something like that. Um, and... I will show it to you, and then I will describe it for our listeners. Two girls I know what... Wait. Two girls I know. Yeah. Two girls I know want to meet you in the worst way. Prostitution, gonorrhea, and syphilis. <laughs> the young, the brave, the strong. That gentleman did nothing wrong. He was seduced. Innocent. So what we have here is uh, a nice curving staircase, some ladies in some lovely dresses, one of them has a, a totally normal face, and she's kind of sidling up to this soldier who is labeled the young, the brave, the strong. Um, on this, this lovely young woman's dress is written the word prostitution. Coming down this staircase to present themselves to this potential client are two other women in uh, a little bit more raggedy dresses and with skulls for faces. Yes. And uh, they are labeled with the words syphilis and gonorrhea. And uh, yeah, yeah, the, the prostitution... Uh, character here is saying to the soldier, two girls I know want to meet you in the worst way. Oh, dearie. So, hmm. Yes, that was the American Social Hygiene Association put out that poster. Now, this was an actual federal law. The 1918 Chamberlain-Kahn Act, which eventually became known as the American Plan. So here's the text that applies specifically to this situation. That the Secretary of War and the Secretary of the Navy, Navy are hereby authorized and directed to adopt measures for the purpose of assisting the various states in caring for civilian persons whose detention, isolation, quarantine, or commitment to institutions may be found necessary for the protection of the military and naval forces of the United States against venereal diseases. So the American plan man mandated a medical exam for any civilian suspected of having an infection, and a positive test could be proof of prostitution. Again, or just, you know, being within five miles of a military camp, you, you, you have to get tested, apparently. One million dollars was set aside for these efforts. Uh, that's 18 million dollars today. Now, uh, the American plan probably rounded up uh, over time, and all the other associated laws in states and cities across the country, probably rounded up about 30,000 women is the guess, although it, it could be more than that. Um, and uh, the number that were imprisoned was 15,520. Wow. 15,520 women imprisoned. Ah. <sighs> Most of them were just tossed in prison and never hospitalized. They were just thrown in there. Whatever. And yeah, if they're so worried about not spreading these infections, maybe we should stop the infection instead of tossing them in jail. No, no. no we're just, just going to toss them in jail. Okay. Yeah, just, just, just throw them in there. So the federal government had this overall plan, but you really need to, uh, you really need to get this law get its tentacles into the communities. So you have to do that at the local and the state level. So they kind of influence state and city governments to take a, a swing at it. And uh, Stern again tells us, under this statute, those who tested positive for an STI could be held in detention for as long as it took to render him or her non-infectious. I really appreciate this next point he made. On paper, the law was gender neutral. In practice, it almost exclusively focused on regulating women and their bodies. Mm -hmm. There was also pressure from the federal level to get judges on their side. Don't let them rule against the local governments in, in cases where this is popping up in court and the American plan is being weaponized against women. But then the ACLU found out about it. And they said, cool. Sure. Let's fucking go. <laughs> Arrest them all. All the ladies. Even the founder of the ACLU told all the branches, yeah, just go with it. Don't, don't get in the way of, of the government when they just assume that, you know, 
every woman is an evil whore with more dirty diseases than you can shake a dildo at. Like, it just, the ACLU. I'm going to go out on my lawn and shake dildos at people from now on. You really should. I I support this. And, uh, by the way, in a lot of places, these laws are still on the books. So, uh, in the 80s, actually, I said we were going to get a little bit more recent history. The laws uh, that were still around about this were used as support for those who were proponents of locking up HIV and AIDS patients. So they looked at the past and they were like, hmm, they did some stuff right. Let's do that. That was just a proposal. I don't believe that actually came through. So um, these arrests and detainments, it could work a couple different ways. You could have the sweeps uh, like happened with with Margaret in Sacramento. Uh, But sometimes they would just go straight for the prostitution charge. And then you end up in court. Um. Plead guilty, get a fine of $10, and you think, okay, I I can leave now. But no, because you pled guilty in an attempt to just get this behind you, now they think they have reasonable suspicion that you might be diseased. Mm. And so they surprise you with the exam and then probably toss you away. So this is what happened to Billy Smith in Arkansas in 1942. Notice the time there? Again, we're in wartime. And her test came back positive, not just for syphilis, but also gonorrhea. She was tossed in a detention hospital. Within three days, she had a lawsuit up. She was like, I am uh, uh, lawsuiting up and I am pissed at everyone. This is stupid. Good for her. She even used the term concentration camp in her suit. Nice. So after four days of being unlawfully detained, she got her moment in front of a judge. He actually uh, struck down the ordinance and Billy went free. Good judge. But then the Arkansas Supreme Court got its hands on the case on appeal and overturned the overturning. The court said Billy had to go back to isolation and quarantine, but she is smarter than that. She had already taken off. She's not going to wait around for these men to decide her fate. Good job. She did eventually get busted in Memphis and ended up back in detention, in addition to incurring a fine of $127. That's $2,100 today. Yeah, that's a little bump up from the $10 she started with. She did manage to escape that detention. She was caught, but she did seem to have a specific enmity for that particular institution she just she was like okay you can take me to a detention center or a hospital or whatever just don't take me to that one i don't like that one (laughs) and so she did at least get away from there they kept her for just a few weeks longer now stern tells us that other women didn't take the injustice lying down either there were escapes and escape attempts sometimes fatal women actually died trying to get out Mm mm-hmm Um, which if you're going to force a pap smear on me, yeah, yeah, I will risk my life to get away from that. (laughs) I might jump out of a window, yeah. I barely do it voluntarily. And, um, there were riots and fires and general destruction. There were hunger strikes. It was just really a shitty experience to go through. And people got, women got pissed off about doing this. So I do really like, um, as, we, as we wrap this up here, I do really like what Stern says about Billy's phrasing concentration camp in particular. He talks about how the phrase was in regular use then in the media regarding both what was happening in Europe and what was happening on the west coast of America, what they were calling internment. Um, so her use of that phrase, Stern says, quote, reveals a notable degree of worldliness. It also suggests that women being held against their will under the auspices auspices of the plan connected themselves to a larger pattern of resistance against governmental violence and disdain. Gives me a certain, um, not to make it corny or anything, but girl power kind of feeling. Rock on. Like we were, we were, even though we didn't know we had each other, we had each other, you know? But I do think this is one of our biggest flaws as a nation. Um, We like to throw money and laws at a problem without even thinking about the root of the issue. We like to demonize entire populations and terrorize them. You know, um, 
Which we, we still see today. We do still see today. And we just completely ignore the part where the men who are getting infected are seeking these sex workers out. You know, there's enough blame to go around here. No, we can't blame the <laughs> men. No. Um, and ignores the part where there are preventative measures we can take, like sex education, you know, condoms. We can't talk about I that. I know, right? No, no, no. We just toss the dirty skanks in jail and be done with it, and then we don't have to talk about it. That's the goal. I do also wonder um, if, again, I wonder if Chris Garcia, who we share his newspapers.com account. Oh, thank you. Um, if he ever sees my recent searches on there when he hops on there, because I can almost guarantee it. Disease prostitute was one of them. <laughs> I can almost guarantee it because I know since the three of us share the account, I will randomly like pop on and I'll sign in and it'll be like, is this what you want to see? And I'm like, no, but I do now. <laughs> I forgot about the fact that it's sometimes spoiling you too. <laughs> well, so I think actually a lot of mine, just the timing that I'm on there, I think I'm getting on right after Chris <laughs> because I I know for a fact that some of the things I've seen are not you. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't looking like, up anything to do with wrestling in California in the 80s. <laughs> yeah, so like, and, and the timeline is really like who did it mm -hmm. because if I know it's not me and it's past 1953, I know it's Chris. <laughs> yeah. But it's still very interesting to see what you freaks think up. <laughs> I enjoy it very much. It is fun, yeah. So uh, that is uh, the, the tale of the American plan, uh, which was uh, quite American and quite the plan. I do want to note there is uh, a book that Scott W. Stern, who I quoted prolifically throughout this, uh, he wrote called The Trials of Nina McCall, Sex, Surveillance, and the Decades-Long Government Plan to Imprison Promiscuous Women. And he does put promiscuous in quotes. Um, I put it on our old-timey, crummy Amazon wish list. if anybody is interested in us covering this further and more extensively eventually. Um, so uh, the link is in the show notes if you, if you happen to want to pop on over there. I think all you need to do is just, like, buy it and state that you're buying it for another person or cl click that button or whatever. And, you know, if it's on the wish list, it'll go to us. And Kindle is fine, print is fine, whatever. But, yeah, if you're interested in that, um, you know, that that's a, one way you can support us is by looking at the books on that list. And, yeah, uh, or you can just buy us a different book. I know a uh, fan of the show, Paul, has bought us a book before, and we did several cases, actually, from, from the book that he purchased us. Yeah, anthology-type books are like a gold mine. Yeah, so I almost said a minefield because my brain is not It's both, really. Um, <laughs> yeah. But basically, you can buy us things and control us. Yes, yes. You, you can be our puppet master for an episode or two. Be our puppet. Puppet master. So, yeah, that uh, that is the tale. Um, I feel like I have a recipe for you. Oh, good. I need Where something. I that it? actually really pisses me off, that story you <laughs> told. So um, give me something fun that is not just going to make me want to punch okay. people. Okay, I will find something. I, I know I have something. Um, I'm just not sure where I put it. It's really disappointing that Americans haven't learned Here from history. It really is, isn't it? We never do. All right, so this is this is where the word Beauregard, the name Beauregard came oh, to me. Okay. This is Beauregard ham and eggs. And I can't figure out what this would be like. All right, I'm ready. Chop or grind two cups of leftover ham, 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 and fry in butter for a few minutes. Hard cook four eggs, remove the shells, and separate the whites from the yolks. Make a white sauce by cooking one tablespoon of flour with one tablespoon of butter. Then add one and a half cups of milk. Cook for several minutes. Chop the whites of the eggs and add to the white sauce. Place the fried ham in the center of a platter. Pour over the white sauce and sprinkle with the yolks of the eggs, which have been put through the ricer. Finish the dish with a dash of paprika. It would be bland. It does seem like it would be bland. Um, so the ham would be nice and salty, mm -hmm. and the white sauce would be really, really bland, I think, because all you put in there, you made a roux, you added cream, and then you added, like, bits of egg white. Yeah, you didn't there really was, season it. It's just a, it's just a mother sauce. It's yeah, just plain. There's no seasoning at all. It is, like, the most bland Alfredo you've ever had, and the seasoning is grated egg yolk. Yeah, let's at the very least get some cheese in that sauce. 
Yeah, like some cheese would be amazing in that. Like parm it up, Swiss cheese with oh, the ham. Oh, yeah. Yeah, now you're talking. Yeah. So let's add some Swiss to that. Let's just get rid of the eggs entirely, unless you want to do like a poached egg right in the middle of the ham. Mm. See, I've never even had a poached egg. I'm very particular about textures of eggs in particular. Ah, see, I love me a good poached egg, but I'm a huge fan of Eggs Benedict. So there you go. Yeah, it just, I was reading that and I couldn't imagine what it would be like. It's like this, what, this like pile of chopped ham with like a white sauce with egg stuff in it. Like, like with yolks as sprinkled over top. It's all right. Like, what are we doing? We're going to we take this? this and roll with it. We're going to take that boring white sauce. We're going to make it like a Swiss cheese Alfredo and then throw that ham right in the middle. It'll be baller. We are the people in the comments of every recipe online who are like, I made this and my family loved it, except I substituted seven different ingredients and it became a dessert rather than breakfast or so something. I actually <laughs> do that. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't listen to recipes, but I'll look at the picture and be like, that's a good idea. I'm going to take that and run. And then I'll like go back and be like, ha ha ha, I know how to bake this better. <laughs> That's very much uh, this particular practice of ours, the old timey recipe does appeal to that. <laughs> but you know what, it's, I, you've ruined me forever because now like I actually crave bananas with mayonnaise. <laughs> and it's just weird. Like I don't want to eat that in front of anybody, but I want to eat it. <laughs> well, my work here is done. <laughs> Amber is ruined forever because she wants to eat bananas and mayonnaise. It's why is it so good? <laughs> Chop some nuts and sprinkle it on top. The mayo makes it stick to the banana. Yum. <laughs> I want one now. It's so good. It was actually it was good, but I just wonder would it have been so good if it weren't so hot that day? Yes. You know? <laughs> I don't even like bananas and I suffer for it because like I had the worst heartburn after I ate that and I still want it like I know it hurts me and I still want it <laughs> all right I can say that for multiple things in my life yeah really that's that's kind of like you maybe, yeah maybe tattoo yeah that's what I do here well I, I do I need to I need uh beast to actually design my half sleeve mm -hmm. needs to happen I think she needs more guidance. Nope. Yeah. Surprise me. Surprise me with a tattoo. If anyone would like to help me design a half sleeve, let me know. All right. Well, thank you for listening. Um, uh, don't forget about the Patreon, where you can get all of our back catalog, like we said, of bonus episodes, plus five new ones every month, for the price of uh, two round-trip steamship tickets uh, to San Francisco, from San Francisco. Uh, it's, uh, from the M Street Wharf, uh, to, uh, San Francisco and Way Landings. I have no idea. You can r ride around and you can get excellent dining service and, uh, a barbershop suites with bath. <laughs> and maybe arrested. Maybe arrested. Who knows? Yeah. If you're a woman and you happen to be out of doors. So, all right. Uh, thank you for listening, and we'll most likely see you next week, depending on how my recovery is going. But it was uh, it was definitely good to be back. Although I've definitely reached, I'm I'm glad we stuck small, stuck with a small case because I've reached my limit of sitting up. Yeah, but we did miss you, and we are happy to be back. And maybe we'll see you again soon. Soon, <laughs> we definitely will see you again. <laughs> well, we we never actually see you. Well, but whatever. I, I have to go outside. I could get arrested. <laughs> yeah, right. Safer here. So, all right. Um, don't arrest women just for existing. How about that's my, that's my guidance from this episode. Yeah. Somebody design a tattoo for me. There we go. And that's Amber's. So, all right. And bye. Bye. My sources were, uh, articles on history.com and time magazine by Scott W. Stern, Wikipedia, and from newspapers.com. Thank you. Chris Garcia, the Sacramento Bee, the Sacramento Star, the Arkansas Democrat, and the Austin Statesman. I'm also confused as to if you have all of these surgeons, sur let's try that again. <laughs> if you have all these soldiers.